This is Join Us in France, episode 20. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. Today she's going to be doing it with a strange throat, though. I'm sorry, Elise. She has a cold. She'll be back. She'll, she'll be fine. She'll be I'll fine. I'll be fine. I'll keep giving her tea or something. <laughs> um, something stronger. Yeah. <laughs> On today's show... We'll be talking about the beautiful city of Albi, home of the world-famous Toulouse-Lautrec, and where you can visit the Cathedral Sainte-Cécile. It is said to be the biggest brick building in the world. Yep. And it has wonderful southern climate and hospitality, and it really has a lot to offer. Now, before we get started today, I want to thank Grant33178. Isn't that a great name? That's a great name. <laughs> Who took the time to write us an iTunes review? He writes, This podcast has been great. We have been searching for something to help us plan our trip in September. This has not only been very informational, but also it's just fun to listen to. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. And please keep the reviews coming, listeners. It really helps us get found in iTunes and get more visibility. And if you love the show, share it. We're on Facebook. Join us in France. We have a pretty lively community there. And on Twitter, at Paris Podcast. We also get comments on the website, and those are absolutely fabulous too. Let me read you the latest one. Nancy S. writes, I've been enjoying catching up on all of the episodes. The ladies are very in interesting, and I'm learning new things about places that I've already been. Isn't that nice? That is very nice. Well, that's the whole idea, really. It, you need to learn about these places or you go and you look at things and you don't know what you're looking at. And you find out new things all the time. Exactly. So that's a great thing. It has given me... I'm back to, uh, to Nancy, yes. It has given me the itch to go back. So we're planning on stopping in Paris on the way back from Naples next year. She's a world traveler, that's a isn't world. she? That's a little bit of a hop in the jump. Yeah, but. she's great. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. We respond to every comment on the website. So if you want to ask us a question and you want to be sure we'll respond, write it on the website. Don't worry if you can't take notes. You'll find our transcript on joinusinfrance.com forward slash the number 20. The number 20. And now we'll have a little music and we'll come back and talk about Albi. Okay, Lee, so how are you today? I could be actually a little bit better. I always hope my voice lasts as, as far as the podcast goes. Oh, it should, it should. I'm, I'm froggy or sexy, depending on which way you want to look at it, you know, or listen to it, actually. You know. That's great. So what do you have prepared for us today? Uh, so today we're going to do uh, a place outside of Paris that's in the southwest of France. That's oh, yeah, it's way... Close Closer, actually, to where we are. Yeah, it's way, way. Way, way, way. <laughs> And it's Paris. actually, uh, it, it's one of my favorite places to visit, which I'll, I'll talk about why in, in a few minutes. But it's also, I, I realized as we've been doing our podcast and I was doing some note-taking about Albi, it's uh, very important because it is part of the uh, World Heritage Site list from UNESCO, uh, mm -hmm. part of the United Nations. And of course, that is a. I, I thought we'd talk about that for a couple of minutes because there might be people out there who really don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. It's a. Um, it's actually something that was begun by UNESCO, and it started officially in 1972, and it uh, was uh, created by a committee who decided that it would be really important as a way of preserving specific places. Okay. Now the places could be either uh, a building. It could be a, a, a geographical location, or it could be, as in the case of Albi, an entire old city center wow. that they think is worth preserving for its cultural or uh, physical, natural uh, heritage so that other 
people from all over the world can actually come and see it. Right. And what happens is that every single year, different countries present the uh, uh, specific places they would like to have as candidates. Mm -hmm. And there's a committee that is a rotating committee of 21 member countries. Okay. Who review, and it's quite uh, an exhaustive uh, kind of thing where they go over the qualities of the place. They have uh, specific conditions that are very rigorous uh, mm-hmm. that, that certain things have to conform to. And uh, it, it, it involves a certain amount of an investment of money because certain places, when they choose to be on the list, and this is specifically the case of Albi or another city, which we will eventually talk about, which is Bordeaux, uh-huh. because it has to do with the city center. It means they have to invest a lot of money to make it very spiffy, right? bring it up to a certain standard, and provide the amenities so that people who are coming as tourists can and enjoy themselves, even though the, the, they're already there. Yeah, yeah. Now, it turns out that uh, to my great surprise, actually rather indignant surprise, uh, France has one less of these World Heritage Sites than Spain. I am outraged. <laughs> I am absolutely outraged. Well, we, we're going to have to do something about that. We're going to have to do something about that. We're going to have to find another one very soon uh, <laughs> because I cannot believe that Spain has more than France does. Um, there are, that it's a competition uh, or anything. Well, well, in a certain way it is actually, strangely oh. enough, because of course what happens is when you get a, a place that is listed, it brings in a lot of tourist revenue. Mm-mm. It does really bring in masses and masses of tourists because there are more and more people who, when they see that it has this label, because basically that's what it is. It's a label. Yeah. They say, oh, this must be something super, super special. Right. And so they do make an effort to go out of their way to go there. So uh, just to let people know that at this moment, there are 38 of these sites in France. Okay. And... Albi was added to the list in the year 2010. Oh, so it's pretty recent. Very recent. So yeah. is Bordeaux very recent. Okay. Both of them, uh, both of the old city centers of Bordeaux and, and Albi. Mm-hmm. And Albi uh, was on the list for a number of years and for a couple of the reasons that you just mentioned in the introduction, but it was uh, given uh, a big boost by the fact that it has this incredible, incredible uh, cathedral, the St. Cecile Cathedral, and yeah. of course the museum, which is I'll talk about in detail, which is in this incredible palace. So Albi is, uh, to, to, to start talking about it directly again, it's in a department or a region called the Tarn. Right. Now, uh, for those people who aren't really familiar with the way uh, France is divided up, you have regions. We've talked about the city of Strasbourg being in the region of Alsace. And that's a region, which means it's historically an area that actually had a duke or a count or a mm-hmm. king mm-hmm. that became part of, of France at some point or another. The Tarn is not like that. The Tarn is a department, mm-hmm. which is really more like a very, very oversized county. Right. France is divided up into... Uh, 99 of them, although several of them are actually uh, outside continental France because they include things like the uh, islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe and uh, places like that. But these are administrative divisions. Right. And it was basically created after the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's called the Tarn, and this is true for all of these uh, departments because that's what it is, is that the name is generally related to its most significant geographical feature. Okay. And in the uh, department of the Tarn, it is the river. Right. The river, a very beautiful, beautiful river called the Tarn, Mm T-A-R-N. That is a big river that eventually flows into the Garonne, uh, almost at the Bordeaux and at the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a very important river. And it's a fairly long river. And so that is the, and Albi, which is spelled today A L B I, but in its old form was A L B Y. Oh. And it's very cute. You know, when you see things written in sort of old fashioned uh, French or Middle French from the Middle Ages, uh-huh. everything, like there are a couple of little restaurants and there's this very cute little uh, ethnological museum called Old Albi, and it's written with a Y, but it's it's kind of cute, you know, I and mean, it's pronounced exactly the same, so it doesn't really make much difference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Albi is the main city in this department. It's a city 
that has about 54,000 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not very big. It's not very big. But again, as um, I don't know if we've actually mentioned that, but in terms of the way France is, the way France is, the way people live in France, France is a country of thousands of small cities. Correct. And it has only uh, very few of what we would call, as Americans, big cities. Mm -hmm. And so uh, most people who are French would say Albi is definitely a city. I mean, it's over 50,000 people. It's got everything. It's an administrative center for the department. Mm -hmm. It has a university. It has a lot of high tech actually moving into it. And it is, of course, extremely proud of being a world heritage site. (laughs) They won't shut up about it. They won't (laughs) shut up about it. In fact, uh, I I have some colleagues uh, who who work there a lot because they live in Albi. And it's it's gotten to be a little bit of an issue, you know. I mean, there's a kind of snobism about saying, oh, I'm from Albi now. Well, Albi is beautiful. And Albi is a place that uh, we, you and I both know fairly well and that I do love to go to at any time. Uh, I've taken people there a lot. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really a place that is a not to be missed part of the Southwest of France. Right. And, uh, it's lovely. Now it's not a place you can go to directly. If you're in a plane, there is a tiny little airport, but basically it's a place that you can get to by car from a major city like Toulouse, right? Which is it's eighty six uh, kilometers northeast of Toulouse, mm-hmm. which is about it's about a fifty minute drive mm-hmm. on a nice uh, open auto route. Yeah, there's a very nice freeway. There's a very nice freeway. You can also take a train. Again, the lo- the most logical place to leave from is, in fact, of course, Toulouse because it's the major city in the southwest mm-hmm. in the center. And, of course, you can get there also coming from the east or coming from the west. It's a place that uh, lots of people yeah. use as a destination. With the train, you can come With from the train, different ways. driving, and it's in lovely countryside. It's in rolling hills countryside. Mm-hmm. It's not in the mountains. No. The city itself is literally built on the river. It's a very important part of the history of the city of Albi. Yep. It's it's up above a little bit. It's not very high up because it's only about 120 meters above sea level, I think. Right. But the actual old city is very impressive to see coming up from the south because the old part of the city, which is part of the uh, heritage site, is built against the actual old walls that were along the river. And so it's beautiful to see. And it's, as you mentioned, a city that is famous, among other things, for being made entirely or almost entirely of this magnificent red-orange brick, Uh which is the building material exclusively to a small area of the southwest of France. And that includes uh, the city of Montauban, which is a small city also, and the bigger city, which is Toulouse. Mm-hmm. And then small villages in the area. But I object to you calling it orange. You said it's red orange. It's red orange. No, it's red. Well, <laughs> we can get into a really long <laughs> argument about this. This is what I would say. If you take one of the bricks, and we'll talk a little bit about the whole point of the, the, the history of these bricks. And if you look at it at different times of the day, one of the things you will notice and this is true in Albi, this is true in the other brick cities, uh, because it's the same kind of brick. But one of the things that's very special about Albi, especially because of the reflection of the light off of the water in the river, is that I will guarantee you, if you stand a bit back on the other side of the river and look at the old city starting in the early morning and then wait for the end of the day, it will go from pink to orange, to red, it glows, absolutely glows, and it changes color according to the sunlight and to the light. It's really very beautiful. It's very beautiful. Oh, it is beautiful, that's for sure. It's uh, uh, not to to make a pitch for another country in another part of the world, but I know a, a huge number of people who, when they go there, they say, oh my God, it's like Tuscany. 
Uh, uh-huh. So it has a certain quality about it, the city itself and the land right around it and the vegetation that do in fact uh, remind people of, of, of the region of uh, Italy uh, in, in Tuscany and, and thereabouts. And also, of course, the building material. So Albi is a city that in fact did not have great importance centuries and centuries and centuries ago. It was a, a part of uh, the medieval world, but it was basically mostly agricultural for a very long time. There were settlements there from very, very far back. Right. Uh, this is not an area that, of course, was deserted of people, but it was not a major commercial center. It was not a major site like the biggest cities are settled either by the Romans or people like that. And in fact, interestingly enough, uh, through the Middle Ages, it was a place that was known for being what is called a scriptorium. Hmm. And I love that word. A place where they wrote things? A place where they wrote. Now, who who wrote what in the Middle Ages? Well, monks. in fact, it was monks. <laughs> exactly. They were among the few people starting after basically the... Uh, we can call the fall of the, the French Roman Empire, who maintained the tradition of writing mm-hmm. uh, for reasons that to this day elude me completely. Many, many people who knew how to read and write uh, when when the Romans basically controlled most of what is Gaul, uh, which is France, uh-huh. for some reason, once these massive invasions, and one day we'll just do a maybe a podcast about invasions, but when they began... Almost everything that involved technology and advancement in in learning pretty much came to a halt. Mm. And and the monasteries, the Christian Catholic monasteries, were one of the uh, were the f- places where ma- most of these traditions, at least in terms of literacy and culture and everything, were maintained. And there was a huge monastery up on the hill in what is now the center of uh, Albi. It doesn't longer; it no longer exists, but it, we know for a fact that it was there. And the monks were copiers, and this is the way they worked before there was a printing press. Of course, was that they copied right. books, uh, and they copied them. Of course, it took a very long time, and a lot of these books, mostly, of course, were connected to religious texts, but not always. Mm-hmm. And they sometimes had these magnificent illustrations, which is what we call now an illuminated manuscript. But it was a very, very, very important center of writing, and the name for that in Latin, which is what they were called, was a scriptorium. A scriptorium. That's a a really nice name. Isn't that a nice name? I love it. it's really good. Which, of course, is where we get our word script for writing. Right. Of course, nowadays, very few people know script writing anymore. The young ones don't know anything except hitting on a keyboard. No, no, no. In France, they still know. They still know. Yeah. My daughter still comes home and says to me, I have to do better handwriting. She's 16. She's 16. She shouldn't care about it anymore, but oh, she does. She I does. think that's very nice, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, you know, if you ever, ever have, ever have to have a handwritten note from somebody, it's not usually very legible anymore. You yeah, know? yeah. But anyway, so Albi was basically known for that. It had some other activities around it. Of course, it goes back very far, like almost every place in France. And then starting in what is, of course, in terms of French history, a more recent past, which is the 13th century, it became very important because it became the seat of a cathedral. Right. Usually they put the cathedrals in places where there are a lot of people and a lot of things happening, especially a massive one like that. Right. But here it was exactly the opposite. What happened was it was a really small town. It was not an important town at all. Mm -hmm. It had a very famous monastery. It had a certain number of people. But because of its location and because, and this gets into the long, complicated history of basically what went on in the southwest of France for a few centuries, because it was a region centered around Albi that was very, very faithful to the Roman Catholic Church, mm-hmm. it was decided. And when I say it was decided, I purposely put it in that form in the passive tense because it was really decided by Rome, by the popes, that it would be a perfect place to build a huge cathedral and to rally people around the cathedral. And so, and there are other examples of cities like this in France, but this is a perfect example. The city was built up around the church. So they put the cart before the horse. They put the cart before the horse. And it worked. And it certainly, certainly worked. That's cool. (laughs) Now, it certainly worked also that they spent an enormous amount of money 
to build one of the most magnificent and one of the most enormous cathedrals that you will see. Yeah. But it's very different from any of the cathedrals you will see up in the north of it's France. It's true. It looks very different. It's very, very different. It's more like a fortress-looking thing. It's a fortress. And not only that, you just, if, you know, if there was a little duck that could come down would give you a kiss, it would give you a kiss because of the word fortress that you just mentioned. <laughs> the, 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 the cathedral itself is actually, uh, I don't know if you even know this, that the fact that you just said that, the, the, well, you and I know that there's a lot of history in the South west of France that has to do with uh, basically a religious war. Yes. And this religious war, which took place in the 13th century, was between uh, the Roman Catholics, the Roman Catholic Church, if you will, which had a very important political power and had its own military, and uh, people who were creating a new religion. Now, this is not Protestantism. This is way before all of that. Yeah. But it was basically a new Christian religion and many, many, many people in the southwest of France were leaving the Catholic Church and going to this new religion. And it's a, a religion that is called uh, now, because that's not exactly what it was called then, but it's called now Catharism, which is... The Cathars, uh, yeah. Cathars, uh, the Cathar, which is C-A-T-H-A-R. And uh, what happened was... And this is really integral to the city uh, and the history of the building of this cathedral, is that... Unfortunately for the Roman Catholic Church, it was not the poor people and the peasants who were moving away from the church. Because you have to remember that in all through the Middle Ages and up until really the French Revolution, the church was not just a religious authority, it was a political authority. Of course. And of course. people gave enormous amounts of money to the church. The mm -hmm. church ruled over lords and, and, and told a lot of the counts and, and princes and dukes what to do, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was that there were lots of lords and ladies who were moving away from the Roman Catholic Church and moving into this new movement. So that is a big threat. It yeah. becomes a big threat to the Roman Catholic Church. What happened was, and we'll talk about this another time in detail, but basically what happened was that for a period of uh, over 30 years, uh, off and on, there was a really terrible war, which we could consider to be a kind of civil war in the southwest region of what is now France. Mm -hmm. And this war was eventually won by the troops of the Roman Catholic Church in conjunction with the troops of the king of Paris. Right. Who was not, until this time, the king of the south. Yeah. If you, if you visit old Cathar castles, which I enjoy doing, they're usually perched up on a mountain They're side. perched up on a mountain, but there's another reason for that, and mm. that is because they basically reused old fortified castles that existed already. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, those castles are way perched up there, and so it's a good hike, but... Uh, they're all mostly destroyed. I mean, they they're lost. They lost the war. You know, there isn't one of them that's still standing. No, <clears throat> um, they're all ruins. They're all ruins. But they're fun to visit. And we'll, so we'll, we'll have to do a, well, a we podcast do. on the well, Cathars. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting subject, not just for the history, but also the religious aspect the of religious it. They had a really aspect. strange theology. That's right. So it's interesting. It's to a think very, about. very fascinating. And story. there are no Cathars to this day, I believe. I mean, they don't, no. they're, they're extinct as far as I know. They are literally extinct. Yeah. Yeah. That's the right word. Yeah. So w in fact, what happened was, uh, th this war ended, uh, and two major things happened. One that has significance all over. And that is that by virtue of losing the war, the people, the lords, the counts and the viscounts and all of the people here in the Southwest basically not only had to sign a treaty, but signed over all of this region. And it became, starting in the year 1279, which is really three quarters of the way through the 13th century, it was starting at that date that this region became part of the kingdom of France. Oh, wow. So it was not before that. And at the same time, there is this building of this incredible cathedral. Now, the cathedral is named after uh, St. Saint, Saint Cecile, who Cecilia. is the patron saint of music. Oh, that's right. I know She's that. She's the patron saint of music. Every year on St. Cecile, choirs around France do 
special specials yeah special production special concerts right so right. The, she's kind of the patron saint of choirs too right <laughs> and uh they began the building of the church in uh, basically just about the middle of the 13th century albi is a region that has wonderful clay clay just like in other parts of the, the southwest is the basic building material that they used for building. Mm -hmm. The reason why they chose to make the cathedral out of brick is twofold, actually. There are two reasons. One is there are no stone quarries nearby. Right. So stone would have been extraordinarily expensive. And the other reason is that they wanted to make this building, which is, to use a word that I don't often use, humongous. <laughs> oh, it's huge. Yeah. It's 110 <laughs> meters long. And it is on top of the church spire, 78 meters tall. It's, mm -hmm. It is massive. The word fortress is totally appropriate for it. It, yeah, it was has a, designed it has to a, be that way. Right. It has this, uh, uh, yeah, fortress quality to it right. visually. Visually. Yeah, I mean, go to the website. I always put lots of pictures and I'm probably going to have to take a special trip. I'm very excited. I'm getting a new camera. Oh. And a new Zoom lens. Oh, my goodness. Oh, here we go. For my new birthday. Zooms. She's going to get a Zoom. <laughs> You're going to, there will be things I'm going to ask you to take pictures of. If you get a Zoom, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to make a list. Here we go. Yeah. So, so I'll probably take a special trip to, I'll be just to take pictures for the podcast because I just enjoy it. And it's, it's beautiful. You know, and it's beautiful. Oh, I got to tell another story. You were talking about the clay in this area. Yes. Most places around here, you have at least 10 meters of clay before you get to any rock. And that means that houses that are, built, that are built around here tend to shift because they're built out of brick, uh, uh, co concrete blocks sometimes, right. but also they make red brick, big construction kind of brick that looks like concrete blocks. And they shift and we're, we have all sorts of problems because of this super thick layer of, of, clay. of clay. And so clay is uh, in the area in abundance. I in mean, abundance. You know, yes. it's everywhere. And yeah, and, and it would be... So when they, when they build buildings, they have to put pylons that go all the way down 10 meters or sometimes more to find rock so that the buildings will rest on rock and not clay. Because clay, it expands, it shrinks, it moves all the time, and so your buildings move. Anyway, that's just me and my technical she, things. She's in her technical things, right? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the the, uh, the brick-making technique was actually introduced by the Romans 2,000 years ago. Right. They came with the, the brick-making techniques and the molds, you know, and, of course, one of the advantages of building something out of brick is that you can actually make the bricks right there. Mm -hmm. They would have what were literally like portable uh, ovens for firing uh, the bricks. Wow. And to this day, we call this kind of brick that you have around here Roman brick. Mm. And it's a very different kind of brick than what you see in either the United States or in uh, the north of France, which has a brick that's similar to what you see in England. The brick down here is thinner. It's bigger. It's got a very big surface. Right, it's flat. It's flatter. And uh, it is not the same color. It is more orange, not red. <sighs> there and you go so again with here your we orange. Go. It's an orange <laughs> color. Uh, all you have to do is scrape it and you see. But what happened was that there was basically uh, a directive given to make Alby the new center of uh, a bishopric where there would be a bishop, and then eventually it was an archbishop, actually. Mm. And so they were given a huge amount of money to make this enormous church. And because they wanted to bring people back into the church who had left, even though the war was over, most of the people reconciled with the fact that, well, this, this was over. And if they wanted to get on with their lives, since they were not leaving Christianity, many people, in fact, decided it might as well be just going back to the Roman Catholic Church as mm -hmm. long as there was going to be some kind of admission that things had to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that uh, the, the bishop and, of course, all of the people in charge of building the cathedral did was, in, in fact, as a doctrine, they decided to make it so that the outside of the church would be very, very, very austere and would indeed look exactly like a ship or a fortress with a prow 
and that this would give the impression as a symbolic gesture that they were strong and that they would lead people. It's very, very interesting to read the way they talked about it in those days. Everything was very, very abstract, and yet it was very clear to people when they could see things what that meant. So what they did was they made a church that is, as you well know, incredibly austere and very monumental and very, very impressive on the outside. And in contrast... And this was a very interesting idea because you don't have this in the north of France where Gothic architecture is sort of like all over the place, outside and in. What they did here was they made it so that when you enter the door, when you enter into the Cathedral of Saint-Cécile, you are literally overwhelmed by the color, by the painting, by the decoration, everywhere, everywhere. It's really striking how it's... it's, uh... Fortress looking on the outside, stark and military-like. And then inside, it's really decorated. It's beautiful. It's colorful and it's pleasant and it's homey almost. Well, but it's big. I mean, it's so big. I wouldn't call it homey because it's too big. Yeah, it's hard to say homey. It's too big, yeah. But in fact, it's very interesting because when you, uh, as I very often take people there, even though I explain a lot on the outside before we go in, It's very interesting. You know, people tend to have one of two reactions. They either, like you, love the inside Uh or they hate it. (laughs) And the reason why they hate it is just because it's almost like they can't deal with how overly decorated it is. Well, it is a lot. It is a lot. But... I it bet is there's some very, nice very devils famous. and stuff in there. Oh, I'm there gonna are. To, I'm going to have to go and it's look not, for them. No, it's not that there are devils. This is something that is a, uh, a well-known secret for those who are initiated into knowing this. So you are now going to be initiated into knowing this. Oh, wow. <laughs> you have major parts of the church on the inside that people go to see because of how important they are in terms of the decoration. The ceiling is a ceiling that was painted. It's The ceiling itself is over 30 meters high and was painted in less than four years, which is utterly remarkable because it's almost uh, 99 meters long. Mm-hmm. When you go inside St. Cecile, when you look up, the painting that you see and the colors you see are the original. Mm. They have never been blackened by soot because they're so high up. And it is known as oh, yeah. Lombardy blue. There's blue, gold, silver. Yeah. Basically the three main colors. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. This, this It's a beautiful blue. It's magnificent. And it's, it's like a sky, it's but a just sky. prettier. <laughs> well, it tells the whole story of the Old Testament and the New Testament from one end to the other. Oh, I'm going to have to take pictures of that. And uh, it is. Uh, it was commissioned. It, they brought these uh, artists from northern Italy to do the painting. There's also a very, very famous... Uh, painting of the last judgment. That's my favorite thing actually Mm. inside because talk about devils there. You get lots of wonderful little devils. It's kind of gruesome. It's like looking at a Bosch painting or something like that. Uh, It is a fabulous, it is considered to be the largest mural painting of the last judgment in any church in France. Mm. It's uh, it, it's uh, shows what happens to you if you commit one of the seven deadly sins. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> so you just have to pick which one, you know, just, oh, just pick, just pick. <laughs> However, uh, and this is one of the things I, I always tell people when we go in, because there's this gaping hole right in the middle of this huge wall, because it's painted on a part of the wall that it's painted directly on the brick, by the way. I mean, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the other thing about the cathedral is that it is only brick. There is no filler. They've done laser, uh, uh, testing to see. And when you see it, you will understand what we're talking about when you say that it's unfathomable the number of bricks because the walls are over two meters thick. The 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 uh, buttressing, which is basically in the walls, it's not flying buttresses as you would see in Notre Dame in Paris or any of the others. No, it's it just basically fly. it's the yeah. wall. It yeah. doesn't fly. It just stays there, very solid. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, all of this is over two meters thick, and it is nothing, nothing but brick everywhere. So uh, there was, and this is a true story, in the 16th century. Uh, a new bishop, and uh, uh, bishops, of course, have uh, a lot to say about what happens in a church, and they can redesign things. They can add things to the outside. They can add things to the inside. They really have an enormous amount of power, not just ecclesiastic power, but monetary power. And there was a bishop, and he decided that he wanted to have a chapel opened up under 
what is actually the church tower Mm -hmm. because there is an open space back there that originally just had a, a small side secret door to get into. And in order to do that, he had to cut through this wall that was basically almost two meters thick in the center, the dead center of this incredible mural of the Last Judgment. Mm. And so there's a piece missing. Hmm. So if you take a look at this mural from left to right, you see uh, the people are going to go to heaven. Always on the right side, by the way. You of know, course. Uh, only on the right side. If you're lefties like us, we're out of luck, you know. Like, <laughs> we're not headed for up there, we're I don't sinister. think. We're sinister. And the people on the left are uh, going to go down below. And it's very lurid and very graphic and very clear. This is what happens to you if you go up, if you're a good person, if you've been a good person because they look at your book of life. It tells the story of what you've done. And they have all these people standing there naked holding out their book kind of with this look on their face saying, please, can I go up there, you know? <laughs> and then on the other side, you have the people who are being sent down and you can see all these wonderful devils and creatures mm. basically sending them into boiling pots and all kinds of wonderful tortures, oh, you know? we're going to have fun there. <laughs> but it lists in uh, old French the names of the different sins along mm, the way. Mm, mm, mm. Now, interestingly enough, there has to be a sin missing because there's a central piece missing besides the fact that in the middle they would have had a picture of Christ basically with one hand pointing up and the other hand pointing down, kind of giving directions like a traffic director, you know, it was like, <laughs> okay guys up there on the right side, down here on the left side. Uh -huh. uh, and so as far as I'm concerned, even though it's actually not true, the sin that should be missing is pride. Ah. Uh because this bishop probably is down there below somewhere, you know, <laughs> boiling in a pot because he actually cut this magnificent work of art from Flemish painters mm. just so that he could have a chapel named after him in the mm, back. Mm. Um, and, and he's got to have his just do somewhere, yeah, you know? And yeah, that's prideful. It's mm -hmm. prideful. Uh, mm -hmm. This is really, really bad. Yeah, I'll look for him when I go yeah, take you, pictures. Yeah, you, you better go look, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> now, the other things on the inside of San Cecil, of course, uh, that are very famous uh, are the choir, which is the center part where there was uh, a closed area close off by a thing that some people might not know what it is. It's called a rood screen. It's a strange word, R-O-O-D. Huh. Uh, it's in, in San Cecil, it's made of magnificent hand-carved limestone in flamboyant Gothic style architecture. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a thing that started in the 1400s that was used uh, to divide the space inside a church in half so that one side of it or one half of the space is really available for townspeople to come in for services. And the other half is designed to house uh, the monks because there's always a group of monks who take care of a church that that's that big and that important. Yeah. And inside this space, they sit and sing and do their own services, but they are not to be seen by the townspeople. Oh, I see. So uh, the choir is literally from, of course, the idea of a choir, which is where they sang. Mm -hmm. And since San Cecil is devoted to this saint, who is the patron saint of music, who, by the way, is not from Albi, but was born and died in Rome. Okay. And it has to do with a translation of a piece of liturgy in terms of what the story of her sainthood and martyrdom was, that they said that the angels sang and harps played and it came to be that she was associated with music. And oh, so nice. she has become the patron saint of music. So uh, the root screen is, uh, is, is an uh, incredible piece of work. It's, and once you go into the choir, which takes you to the second half of the church, which, by the way, now you do have to pay two euros to go into and, and see, you have a collection of Renaissance sculpture that is one of the most complete and rarest in all of France. Mm. And Renaissance sculpture is different from sculpture from earlier times because the features are very realistic. And these are what they call polychrome, which means that there are several colors on them. It's all stone, by the way. Mm. It's all made of limestone. And the sculptures themselves are not full size, but they are so realistic they have never been fixed. They've never been touched up. Some of them have a little bit of chips on them. Some of them need a little bit of dusting. You know, they don't <laughs> seem to be able to get up on top and dust off the top of their heads. But they are absolutely remarkable. 
and they are one of the reasons why p- the church itself is considered to be a work of art. Right. Uh, it's not just the building itself, which is in and of itself very impressive. It's that they brought in artists from Italy, they brought in artists from Flanders, they brought in artists from northern France, and each of these groups of artists, who of course are all anonymous, did work that is unique, and all of the work inside the church is the original work. So this was done in the 1200s, right? This was done. The church was begun starting in the end of the 13th century or the third quarter of the 13th century. However, the actual decoration inside the church was not done until the very end of the 15th century, starting in the 1490s. Wow. It took that long for the church to be built, Mm -hmm. to be finished. And the ceiling was done between 1500 and 1504. Mm. And so we know uh, the, 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 what they do know because the archives are, uh, the archives show when things were done because they show when things were paid for. Okay. So we don't know the names of the artists, but we do know exactly where these different groups of artists came from. And we know exactly when they finished the work because this is when the particular guild or corporation was paid. And so they have exact dates for the painting of the ceiling. They have exact dates for the root screen and they have little bit approximate dates for the beautiful polychrome sculpture because they can tell by the style of the clothing and the headdresses that the people wear that it is, in fact, from the very, 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 very end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century. Okay. Which is Renaissance. Right, right. Now, this is San Cecil. Uh, it, it is a church that is fabulous to visit. It's a church that is fabulous to go to listen to a concert. Mm-hmm. There's a huge organ, and there are uh, various times of the years when there are a series of uh, musical concerts, which is normal for a church that has as its patron saint, of course, yeah. uh, a saint that's connected to music. Yeah, San Cecil, I mean. <laughs> San Cecil, you know. I have to. <laughs> and this is, there's only one thing with the church, and this is a part of the disadvantage, if you will, of being now a World Heritage Site. It is flooded with people all the time. It used to be very, very popular. It used to be, uh, there are lots of groups that come with guides, local guides, other guides like me, who come from other places to go see it. But now what has happened is that the city is is biting its uh, tongue in a sense because they were so proud of how important they were and everything else and now what they're doing is they're regulating the traffic inside San Cecil mm. now if you go uh, one person two people three people four that's nothing it's no big yeah, deal you can do what you want you can do what you want it is always closed when there's any kind of official ceremony obviously of course uh, funerals weddings mass it used to be that people could come in the back, but now it's gotten to the point where they actually ask groups to reserve because they require them to use headphones and these tiny little microphones to talk inside the church because there were people complaining that during funerals and weddings, the people who were participating in the ceremonies couldn't even hear what the priest was saying. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, it is a church. You it's have a church. To, yeah. It's a church and it's still a cathedral. Yeah. And I think it's very important because I think a lot of people get used to going into very big churches. Notre Dame in Paris is a perfect example where nobody seems to care whether you talk and you walk around. It's, it's, big it's very very big there can be mass I, the last time i was there with a few people mass was going on because there's mass several times a day in notre dame in paris and you just are asked not to scream and yell and things like that and obviously you don't go inside a big church like that wearing short shorts you just don't right, right. it's just a sign of respect but in fact in saint cecile because of the nature of the structure it's southern gothic style which means there are no side aisles that is, there's no pillars where you can walk around and circulate. It's one big, massive open space in mm-hmm, the center. Mm-hmm. And so they've had to do basically uh, some work to control the influx of people inside the church. Right. Now, during the summer months, it's open all day. For the rest of the year, it closes, just like other buildings and businesses do between 12 and 2. Mm-hmm. And of course, if there is, if you have 
the misfortune to go to Halby on a day when uh, there is some kind of special ceremony, you just have to be able to wait with patience until that ceremony is over to be able to go inside the even church. Even if, even if it's just a few people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, what What's happened is that it's really become even more than with the museum. The church has had to deal with uh, traffic, and and yeah. and they they have reached the point where if you go in a, if you're one person maybe they won't bother you if you go in and stand in the back but they are very very sensitive at this point to uh count well, that's good to know. people you know so th that of course is one of the two major edifices that of course is what brings people to albi knowing that the entire old city center is part of the world heritage site not just the church not just the one building right now the other building that is very important is the building right next to it, and that is called the Bishop's Palace. Yes. It's made of brick, and believe it or not, the Bishop's Palace was actually begun 20 years before the church. Mm. <laughs> it was begun because... They had their priorities. They right. had their priorities, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, this is part of, uh, without being disrespectful, uh, part of the history of the Catholic Church and bishops is that all of the bishops were always noblemen. Mm -hmm. They always had a lot of money, They had money from their own families, but they also gathered the tithe, the 10% that everybody faithful to the church gave, and they could really decide how to spend that money. Uh, the money wasn't necessarily redistributed back to, to other people. And the very first uh, bishop of the uh, cathedral in the old cathedral, because the San Cecil actually takes the place of the cathedral that was there before. There's nothing left of the ancient, ancient cathedral that was there. Right. He decided that it was uh, time to build a magnificent palace to show the glory of the Catholic Church. And what he did was, and this, of course, uh, uh, is one of the things that makes it magnificent to see, that the old city of Albi, the oldest part of the city center, as you mentioned, is up above on a hill. It's just above the banks of the Tarn River. Mm -hmm. And they had... The oldest part had walls around it, brick walls, mm -hmm. fortified. It was a fortified city like mm -hmm. everything was in the early Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And so when they decided to build the bishop's palace, they said, well, we have one wall already, the wall that runs along the banks of the Tarn River. Let's just use that uh, to be the barrier or on one side of the limit on one side of the bishop's palace. Okay. And let's continue around And so they started working from there on, which is why the Bishop's Palace actually includes a piece of the wall, of the ancient wall that overlooks the banks of the river. Okay. So the uh, Bishop's Palace was built in several different uh, episodes, time periods, if you want. The first part looks almost feudal, and it has the same feeling as the church. That is, it's very monolithic. It's this tall almost square tower kind of piece. Mm -hmm. Little by little, starting at the end of the 1200s, remember, we're working our way up, they added different wings to the palace. There were two small courtyards. Eventually, you get into the Renaissance, and the bishops start adding on sections to the palace that look more like a northern palace, not mm -hmm. a southern one, so that you have these nice cone-shaped little roofs, roofs with slate on them. They kind of look a little mm. bit like uh, Disney World, a uh, little bit more that kind of style. Out of place. Out of place, but yeah. it's still there. <laughs> And there's a bishop in the, uh, 15, the end of the 15th century who comes from the north and who adds what is called a French garden. And, of course, a French garden is a manicured, geometric garden yeah. where everything is plotted out. And it's basically kind of walking through a puzzle. In a, but it's not a labyrinth. It's just an open right. uh, French it's short, garden. Yeah. It's short. It, the, the shrubs are very low. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful. Yeah, it's nice. And what he did was, by the 15th century... And it's not really big. I mean, it's, you know... No. I mean, I wouldn't be able to give you an idea of exactly the size of it. It's nice. It's a, it's a garden. It's an not a park. Right. right, right. It's not bigger than that. No. But what he did was, he said, well, we are no longer in need of these uh, ramparts that uh, protect us from the river. By the end of the 1400s, by the end of the 15th century, things had calmed down. And so he said, let's see if we can turn this into a walkway. 
And so, of course, that's why it is to this day, this absolutely gorgeous walkway. Yeah, you walk on it, yeah. You walk on it. So uh, before you actually go into the Bishop's Palace, which is now, of course, an art museum, you can actually go without having to go into the museum at all. You walk around the back, and they've redone it because, of course, this was part of what they did for the uh, designation as a World Heritage Site. So it was all worked on in the, starting in the year 2000. And you have this magnificent walkway. You walk down, you can walk all the way around, and you get a view over the banks. Basically, there's a road down below, and there's a little bit of a walkway, but you get to see the river and the other side and the old bridge, which is part of the uh, designated area. And it is older than any of the oldest bridges in the region. It is a bridge, literally, part of it still standing is from the 1100s. Wow. It's a really old bridge. Good bridge. They good did a bridge. Good job, yeah. Yeah, they reinforced it so that cars could go over it because the cars do, but it actually is that old a bridge. And when you go and walk on this walkway behind the palace, you get to see the relatively new. It always makes me laugh because, of course, new means it was basically started in the 1400s. The <laughs> new part of Albi on the other side, all of it's still built of this magnificent brick. And you see the cypress trees and the pine trees and all of that, which is why people say, oh, my goodness, this is like what they think of as Tuscany and stuff like that, which, right, of course, right. is it's not Tuscany. It's southwest France, you know. Right. It's well, beautiful. A it's lot of similarities, gorgeous. yeah. And so it's part of those beautiful part. It's a lovely thing to do. I, if you go to Albi, you must, must, must go and do the garden and the walk around, uh, the, the, the walkway, well, which you, is now a promenade, you know. Right, you can't get into the museum. You cannot get into the museum from the garden. You cannot or you no, can? No, you cannot. Oh, I thought no. that's how you got there. No, I, I no, no, no. It's been revamped many times oh, okay. in the last 10 years. Now, to go to the museum, you go down the steps right next to what is actually the tourist office of Albi. It's a, literally a costly esplanade from the church. Mm -hmm. it's, 25 meters away mm -hmm. and you go down the steps of this very beautiful manicured garden and you go into a very small courtyard uh -huh. very medieval fortified looking uh there are open air concerts there in the summertime mm -hmm. and you go in these now very beautiful modern double doors uh to go into the uh building which is now a museum and it is not a museum it is the toulouse lautrec museum right now This is what people need to know because this is, of course, one of the things that makes me want to go back to, Al to Albi all the time. It is the largest collection in the world of work by the artist Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec for the simple reason that he was born in Albi. Yep. He was born in Albi. He was the descendant on both his mother and father's side of the original Counts of Toulouse. Mm -hmm. Both his, his mother was a countess, his father was a count. They were actually first cousins, <laughs> which is part of what uh, created the destiny of uh, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec because uh, most people who, who know anything about him have probably seen his posters. And if you have seen one of the movies about him, you know that he was someone who was crippled. Yes. Starting at the age of 16. Uh, the story of the fact that this is the museum of his work is a part of the story of his life, which is actually quite sad. Mm. He was uh, born, uh, he died at the age of 37. Oh, wow. In 1901. Mm. And he died uh, in the South, not in Albi, but he died uh, literally in his mother's arms in uh, in one of the chateaux that his family had in the southwest of France because they had several different chateaux besides the ma the manor house that they had in the city. And uh, the, he was, uh, when he died, he died of a combination of alcoholism and syphilis. Uh. But he'd already been very, very sick and... Uh, Uh, very, very, very sick, starting in his early 20s. It didn't take him long. Now, there is a suspicion to, that nobody can confirm anymore that, in fact, uh, he got the syphilis not from himself having certain activities, which he did have, we know, with prostitutes, but he got it actually from his father, mm. who was uh, a very strange man. Uh, he was uh, <laughs> what is called uh, a gentleman count who did nothing with his life but have fun. Mm. Um, I can't imagine what those kinds of people's lives were like. But anyway, Toulouse Trek was born in Albi because his mother had already had a couple of uh, stillborn babies. 
and she decided that even though they lived most of the time on the lands of one of several chateaux that they had, one near Bordeaux, one actually uh, almost near the Mediterranean, that she needed to be in a city. This is, of course, uh, we're talking about the 1860s. And so she came back to Albi, where they had a townhouse, and that is where Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec was born. And you can go walk one of the old city streets and pass the house where he was born. There's a plaque outside that indicates that. Mm. And he basically grew up, not in Albi, but going around from one chateau to the other. He loved horses. He rode. He loved to draw. He was a gifted, gifted, gifted young man. He was born with an incredible talent. He took lessons, but he was considered to be a dilettante because he was going to grow up to be a count, and counts don't work. Whatever they do, <laughs> they don't work. And what happened was, and this is a story that most people know, but it's really worth saying because it really helps understand what happened afterwards. At the age of 16, he had two accidents. First one, he fell off a horse, mm. And he broke a leg, but he didn't break it in one place. He literally shattered the bones in the leg. And he was treated for it. And he started to walk again, but with a very bad limp. And the doctors, even in those days, knew that there was a disease called glass bones. Mm. And uh, one of the doctors that treated the family suspected that there was something other than just the fact that he'd fallen off a horse. There was a problem. Yeah, And uh, he... Uh, very soon after that, several months laugh after that, fell again, this time in a very odd way, in the house and broke the other leg mm. and broke it in, in fact, the same way. And it mm. was at that point that the doctors, uh, who had no idea of how to treat anything like that, decided that, in fact, he was someone who had this terrible uh, disease mm -hmm. called glass bones and they announced to him and to his parents that his legs would never grow again. And right. So what happened was he has really when you see he had very photos, short legs, very yeah. short legs with a long torso. He, well, he his, looks disproportionate. Well, his in fact, what happened was he was normal sized from the waist up, mm -hmm. but his legs, re, they basically he lost some length in his legs and the bones in his legs after he had these two accidents Fractures, yeah. and he walked forever and ever for the rest of his life with enormous amount of pain both legs with a cane on each side mm -hmm. and it was very very difficult for him to actually get around mm. uh, and what happened was that because of this at the age of 18 he did something that he should never ever have done he said to his parents, and his relationship with his father was apparently not the best. He was very, very close to his mother, very close. She supported him through everything. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will never be normal. I will never ride. I will never be a lord. I want to be an artist. This is what I feel my life is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Paris. And his mother gave her blessings because she knew that he had this born talent. And since he never needed money, this is one of the things about Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec is that he was supported by his mother. They were very, very wealthy. Yeah. He never had to worry about money. He never had to worry about selling his painting. He went to Paris. He moved to Montmartre, a place we're going to talk about yeah. in the near future. And he started hanging out with the artists that he met because this at the time was really a place... Uh, bohemian in the mar modern sense of the term, but it was also a place where all the artists were, where the writers were, it's where the cabaret were. And he was interested in humans. Interestingly enough, as miserable as he was in terms of his body and as unhappy as he must have been because he literally did drink himself to death, mm -hmm. he loved people. Mm. And his the main subject of all of his work, aside from a few works that are about horses and the countryside, are people. Yeah. And he painted the people in the cabaret, and he painted his mother whenever he went back to see her, which was very, very often. And he painted his best friend, who was also his first cousin, a man who stayed with him and was with him also the day he died, because he had become a doctor. Oh, and there's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful painting of uh, this man who is his first cousin in this collection. So 
we'll talk just a little bit about what happened. That is, he lived, he produced work most of his life. He was not recognized by other people. His work was rejected because the subject matter of his work was prostitutes, poor people, dressmakers, hat makers, cabaret dancers. Uh, who yeah, he was interested in regular people. He was interested in regular people, and he was re- really interested in what we could say were the, let's say, the underground. Uh, this yeah. would be in the 20th century. This would be kind of like Warhol's people, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are people here who are prostitutes. There are people who are drug addicts. But there are also just people who are artists, writers, poets. And this was his world. And it was uh, the other artists who appreciated his work. The public did not like his work. They didn't understand it. They considered what he did to be scandalous. Mm -hmm. So he didn't sell paintings except to other artists. But he didn't care because he had money. He didn't care. But what he did want, which is, of course, what any artist wants, uh, was recognition. Right. And ironically, in the last 10 years of his life, so from the age of 27 on, he became famous little by little, but not for his paintings and drawings, which are absolutely magnificent, but for doing posters. And to this day, this is how he became famous. And this is how it began. One of his friends who had a cabaret and who saw the kind of work he was doing, he asked him if he wouldn't be interested in doing him a favor and make a poster for his cabaret. (laughs) Now, in terms of what a poster was, well, now, of course, we have internet, we have advertising. Up through these times, up through the end of the 19th century, advertising was either in magazines and catalogs, which did exist, or walls and pillars were plastered with things all over the city. Right, right. The pillars in Paris, they have these... right? Yeah, they have these circular pillars on which there's, I mean, there's designated places for posters. posters. But... Until Toulouse Lautrec and a very other and another interesting artist, a man who was actually Czech named Musha M U C H A, okay, who had gone to live in Paris. Strangely enough, they uh, were the two men who changed the nature of what a poster was. Hmm. And what they did was, and this was without really thinking about it, it's just that it was the nature of who he was as an artist. Up until that time, posters were lots of words. Mm-hmm. And no illustration, oh. none. And what he did was he literally revolutionized posters by making it all image and the minimum amount of words, mm-hmm. the name of a place, the address, and if necessary, the dates, for instance, if there was uh-huh. going to be a concert. And that was all. No, ne- Well, there was no telephone, so you didn't have to put a telephone <laughs> number. There was no internet address. No. And what he did was he created these incredible images that were basically kind of like stereotype images, but they were fun and they were very dynamic. And people started asking, who makes these posters, you see? (laughs) And so what happened was that in his lifetime, he created over 35 posters some of the original work and preparation for these posters is actually included in the collection in the in the museum. And he became famous for the posters, which must have been very ironic to him because, of course, what he wanted to be famous for was for his painting and his, for his drawing. But it revolutionized, absolutely revolutionized well, is, posters. Is the, is the technique that different between his posters and his paintings? It's not the technique that is different. No, in style. It's similar. The Mm -hmm. technique is different in the sense that what he did was he was using a technique that was called lithography, which is a whole process of reproduction. And then eventually by the end of his life, literally by the very end of the 19th century, they were able to take some of these and to do what is called photo lithography reproduction. That it was the technique of reproduction, but it wasn't that it looked like it worked. Let's I'll back up to ask answer your question differently. When you see one of his posters and you see one of his paintings, it's his work. Yeah. There is no contradiction between the work that is painting and drawing and the work right. that's a poster. So obviously we know you, all you have to do is see any of them. It doesn't matter. And you know it's a work by Toulouse-Lautrec. He had a very distinctive style. What he did do was 
he revolutionized the idea and actually made what we could consider to be the forerunner of modern advertising by eliminating everything except the bare necessity for information and making it just a dynamic image. Visual. Visual image. And of course, there were two things that influenced him. And one, and it's very important because it really helps understand his work, and that is Japanese art. Mm. Now, what happened was in the second half of the 19th century, a lot of artists in Paris, which was the center of art, really in the second half of the 19th century, they discovered Asian art in a very strange way. Objects were being brought back from China and Japan, and they were wrapped in paper. And a lot of these objects were ceramics and things like that. There was an opening up of the Asian uh, world, and people were doing commerce a lot with Japan and with China. And a lot of these were wrapped in newspaper and magazine paper, and in Japan had developed, starting in the middle of the 18th century, a fabulous new technique called woodcut. And using uh, artists would make these drawings and these beautiful multicolored things that were printed in woodcut. And the woodcut was used as a reproduction technique. And it was put into magazines. And all of this paper arrived in Paris. Mm. And these artists literally discovered it by opening up these wrappings and seeing these beautiful drawings and these images and going, whoa, what's this? It's a very different technique and it's a whole other thing. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But what happened was there was a group of artists and Toulouse Trek was one of them who loved what they saw and decided to use this as inspiration to change a little bit the technique of what they were doing. And the technique is basically a question of composition and it's also a question of color. And so this is one of the major factors in what made his very distinctive style. And, and he gave recognition to this by changing his signature. So when you go to the museum and you look at the drawings and the paintings, you will notice that after a certain time, he made a signature that looks like a Japanese character. Hmm. Wow. And he did this as a way of saying, this is one of the inspirations right, of his right. work. So in fact... This is what happened. So by the time he died, he was starting to become famous, but not for his painting, but for his posters. So here's this man who dies in 1901. His studio is filled, literally filled with hundreds of paintings, thousands of drawings, hmm. except for some of his friends. It's his mother who inherits all of this work. Mm -hmm. And she went around to all the museums in Paris and said, would you take this collection? And every single museum turned him down. Mm. They said, this is vulgar. This is not work that we would like to have in our museum. Oh, and wow. This is, you know, we're still, we're talking when there's already Monet and all of these people, but he was a little bit more cutting edge, you know? Yeah. So she goes back to Albi, and she's desperate for a place that will show her son's work. Mm. And she goes to the local little municipal museum of Albi. And she says, I am the countess of the Toulouse Rotec. I'm actually, she had, her name was longer than that, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> and she's, she's, de machin she's de a, yep, <laughs> she had like a five name name. And yeah. she said, uh, if you are willing to house the collection of my son's artwork, I will guarantee that as long as I live, I will pay for the upkeep of the museum. Oh, wow. And so starting in 1905, the museum in Albi takes on the collection of Toulouse-Lautrec. Hmm. Yeah, it's true. That I, I think that's m m most of what's there. I don't... There's a little bit of other stuff. Mm -hmm. There are two small little rooms. One of them has, ironically enough, uh, work that's... Uh, prehistorical objects that they found from okay. really old times. Yeah, that's and the, old. <laughs> and the other is uh, early 20th century, basically a little bit contemporary with uh, Toulouse-Lautrec. But what has happened is that this, this is the evolution of the history of the museum. She lived till 1922. Mm -hmm. By 1922... He had become famous. Right. The Americans and the Japanese were the first to appreciate his work. Uh -huh. A lot of his work was bought by various people in both countries. Some of it went back up to Paris, finally. Mm -hmm. She said, 
it's the Toulouse Lautrec Museum, and they accepted that that's what it would become. Yeah. So it became not just the Albi Museum; it's the Toulouse Lautrec Museum right. with a foundation. And of course, what happened was Albi realized that it was making money off of people coming to see the work by Toulouse Lautrec. Yeah, and so they kept it. Now, in all the years I have gone to the museum, it went from being a musty museum with a very big collection to the now open remodeled museum that is now air conditioned, which is very good because Albi gets very hot in the summertime Mm -hmm. and uh, it has opened up the space. So you have on one floor, you have all of the work that has to do with the posters on the other floors. You have various different segments of the, the work that he did in terms of painting and everything else. It's a huge museum. It's very, very modern on the inside now, except that they've kept the beautiful walls of the old medieval castle. So you can see, and so it's become a very, very important part of visiting Albi. And of course, one of the things that now is important is that you get to see this enormous collection. I'm going to have to go visit it again because I visited it many years ago and it was the old musty style museum and I didn't keep a very good memory of that. Well, you know what? I have, uh, I know every single work in the museum. I it's, I can't say this about any other artist or any other museum. I know every work that they show in this museum. Mm-hmm. And I don't particularly appreciate the way they have reorganized the distribution of the work. Mm. From my point of view, it was very interesting. In the old museum, they kept it in chronological order. And you could really see from the beginning to the end the evolution of his work. Now, some of the rooms have chronological order now, and some of them don't, but it doesn't matter. The work is fabulous to look at. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you go and you're really interested in understanding his work, I would strongly suggest if you don't go with somebody like me, take an audio guide, Mm -hmm. because otherwise you will not get half of what there is to know about the different work that you see, Mm -hmm. and save time and energy for the part that has to do with the posters, because it's really, really very interesting. Yeah. It really is. Now, the advantage of the new museum is that it is air-conditioned. Albi gets very hot in the summertime. Yeah. It can be 100 degrees out for several weeks in uh, a row, and so it's very nice that it is, in fact, an air-conditioned museum. Mm -hmm. Warning. There are only, and this is ridiculous to say, but I have to say it because it's one of my bêtes noires. And, 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 uh, That's a is, pet peeve. It's a pet peeve. <laughs> they remodeled. They took millions of euros to remodel this museum. And it's one of the reasons they became a world UNESCO site. There are only bathrooms in the basement. Ah. It's a three, there are three floors to this building. There are only bathrooms in the basement, and in order to get to them, you have to take an elevator and go literally out to the reception area and go back up again. And I don't understand the reason for doing something like this. Yeah, yeah. So just be warned. There is wheelchair wheelchair access. They had to to make it a a modern building. Yeah. But it is a real problem, uh, and it, it can take up a certain amount of time if you only you have, have a certain amount back. of time. You have to yeah. go all the way back. You have, there is nothing upstairs at all. Mm. So uh, that is my real pet peeve about this museum. Yeah. Uh, how long would you say you need to spend in Albi between these two major... A half a day. A half a day is all? That's not very long. Well, once you're done with the museum and once you're done with the church, there are two or three other beautiful things to see but then you have the old city center, which in fact is very beautiful, but very, very small. Right. And uh, it's it's lovely to walk around. There are some very nice little shops. Albi is not a very poor city, so it has some very nice little boutique shops. Mm-hmm. There are two or three other things I would like to mention as places to definitely not miss if you're going to visit old Albi. But other than that, uh, what I'm saying is a half a day, including a meal, because Albi is a lovely place to have either a lunch or a dinner. Mm. It has lots of restaurants, very nice places. It has places that are lovely for a lunch that are really right across from the church and from the museum. You also have some other higher end gourmet restaurants, lots and lots of wonderful places to eat. So for me, when I say a half a day, what I mean is you have three to four hours of visit 
and then a nice meal and you have a okay. very nice time in Albi. Yeah. And it's it's really a beautiful place to do that. Now this is I should know this, but is there a specialty dish that's of Albi per se? I don't know. Not this. not really. I mean they okay. have of course like the rest of Southwest, lots of things with duck. Yeah. Duck everything, uh, yeah. If if they have um a specialty pastry, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure if I remember the name of it, but it seems to me that it's a pastry that has a little bit of almonds inside it. They do very nice pastries and macaroons and things like that. Mm -hmm. There's also, uh, right on the uh, big, big open esplanade in front of the San Cecil and in front, of, actually, of the museum itself, there is a branch of this very famous chocolatier Turies who comes from Cord, mm. Sourcel, and he has opened a boutique there. But it... There, other than that, uh, there's no major specialty. They have a couple of very nice wine shops there. Mm -hmm. There are some little wines that are produced nearby in Gayak and places like that. Yeah. They do have a fair amount of lamb in that area, you know, okay. for people who are interested in that kind of thing. But in general, in, in relation to the size of the city, it's a splendid place to eat. And so it's a lovely thing to do is to go there and either do lunch, a nice leisurely lunch, or do dinner. So, well, that's what I'm going to do then. Let me just mention, uh, <laughs> a, as part of the old city center, because remember, they had to get spiffed up so that they could become Correct, part yeah. of this uh, world UNESCO, UNESCO site. Yeah. They have, of course, as I mentioned, the beautiful French gardens with a view over the river. Mm -hmm. You can walk the, down the road that leads out from the church and the museum. It's a beautiful downhill, one-way, <laughs> curving road that takes you to the old bridge. It's really a lovely thing to do because if you walk onto the old bridge... And walk across to the other side. It's possible. It's not very far. It's not a very long walk at all. You get a splendid view of both the palace and the uh, cathedral, cathedral yeah. and the old city because it's right there next to it. Remember, the city developed around the palace and the church. Right. So you have this dense area of magnificent medieval houses with half timbering or Renaissance palaces. Mm -hmm. And you have this one other church that you have to take a look at. From the outside, you don't even have to bother to go on the inside. Off the Esplanade, one of the main two walkways, that's the other thing about Albi is that it has walkways. They're all for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. You have a church called San Salvi. Salvi. S-A-L-V-I. Okay. Just like the other one it used to be Y, but it's now become I. <laughs> it is, in fact, the remnant of what was the oldest church left in Albi. And it was part of a monastery. And that was there before they built San Cecile. And uh, there's a little bit of its cloister left. It's hidden away. You have to go up a little bit of a staircase or go around to a courtyard. It's absolutely splendid. It's mm. from the 1100s. Oh, wow. And it's very, very lovely. It's a quiet little place. The gardeners put beautiful flowers in all year long. So it's mm. really lovely to just sit there and take a couple of photos. The church itself on the inside is not very interesting anymore because it's been redone too many times. But one of the things that's fun to see, if you walk up the pedestrian walkway, uh, uh, walking away from San Cecil, past the chocolate place, just up the road, is that you get to see the church tower. And the church tower is built with three different styles and three different materials. Hmm. And it shows the heritage of the 1100s, the 1200s, and the 1300s. Interesting. And what they did was like a layer cake. They just put <laughs> one kind on top of the other. <laughs> they changed the style. So the lowest level, believe it or not, is made of stone. Hmm. Because at the time, I'm not sure why, they were able to afford to bring in white limestone from mm -hmm. somewhere not far away. So the lowest level, which is the oldest, is all white stone. Then you have a level that is a combination of brick and stone that moves up into a kind of Gothic style. And then the top part is all brick <laughs> in the later Gothic style. And, you know, as, as I think I've mentioned before, in France, when it comes to building things like castles and churches, they don't raise it to the ground and start all over again. They just go, okay, let's just add something else. And yeah. So w what you are looking at literally is the transition of three centuries and three different styles. <laughs> and it's the only building left like that in the center of Albi. And other than that, Albi is small enough that in a half an hour, 
you can walk around the old city center. You can see some of the beautifully kept up half timbered houses. There's a little tiny, tiny little space called an old museum of Albi called Old Albi, Old Vie Albi. I don't know that it's worth going into, to be honest, but it's beautiful to see on the outside. Okay. And you have a couple of beautiful Renaissance buildings. One of them is the mayor's office and the other is the chamber of commerce. Mm -hmm. And they have courtyards that you can walk into, Mm. except on Sunday when they're closed. Right. And uh, if you just walk around this area, which really is not that big, it just gives you a wonderful feeling for what was a very, very affluent medieval city. Okay. Uh, and so uh, all of Albi is is really very, very splendid. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely going to have to go and do all that. I'll wait for a sunny day. Wait for a sunny day. Yeah. Wait I for can, a sunny if day. If I can get away on a sunny day, it'll be nice. It would be lovely. And maybe we'll go together. That would be a nice thing to do. Sure, I, we'll sure. Do then you can tour. point right me to the... To the, to the to, right places. To the right places. Yeah, Albi is just absolutely beautiful. And once you've been there, you never forget the city. Mm-hmm. And now that they've fixed it up and they've added um, more nice walkways, they've evened out the sidewalks, they made this huge esplanade in front of the cathedral, it's even nicer to visit. Yeah. And just in case people are wondering, they haven't made the restaurants more expensive, oh. at least for the moment. That's good. That's good. I'll take that. (laughs) Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. You have uh, inspired me to go back to Albi. I drive through it all the time. I never stop. I'm I'm always on my way to some basketball game. Uh, Oh, basketball basketball games. My daughter plays basketball and we... uh, we play in a regional tournament and we often have to go north. And if you go north very far from Toulouse, you, you're going to hit Albi. <laughs> no matter what else. You will, uh, northeast. Yeah, yeah, northeast. northeast. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is really beautiful. <laughs> That's great. Okay, well, if you've stayed with us this long, and this show is going to be long, an hour and a half, I think, uh, th- then you must really like us. And that's really gratifying. And the way you can show us some love is by sharing the show. I'm telling you again, we don't have any advertising budget and we don't have Toulouse-Lautrec making posters for us. Unfortunately, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Would, it? it would be lovely. Oh, oh wow. Um, so share the show with your friends. Um, I, I'm a little bit lonely on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Paris Podcast. I like Twitter. I'm, you like Twitter? Well, I'm starting to understand how it works. You know, I didn't. I still haven't figured it out. Yeah, it's a little bit different. You have to, you know, you have to get used to it. It's very su- succinct. Succinct, and you have to say things over and over again to have a chance of people paying attention to you. But anyway, I'm getting the hang of it. I'm enjoying it. So if you like Twitter too, uh, I'm at Paris Podcast. Um, you know, follow me. I'll, I'll follow you right back because I, I like to be... follow you back. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay. Merci. Thank you, Annie. À la semaine prochaine. À la semaine prochaine. Thank you, everybody out there. Thank you, everybody. And we'll talk to you next Saturday. See you. Bye-bye.